Thanks very much for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about CFD and how it applies to motorsport. I can see that from the audience list, there's quite a range of people on the call today. Um, I can see aerodynamicists and designers who, you know, most likely want to use CFD really as a tool. Um, they just want something that's accurate and that runs quickly. Then you have CFD engineers and kind of methodology people, which I suppose is more my background. And, you know, you're the one who's responsible for making it accurate and run quickly. And then there's another group of people I can see, the HPC engineers, the IT people, who have to, you know, create the infrastructure and the environment for the methodology people to create those things that the aerodynamic aerodynamicists can, you know, press the button, um, which creates the designs. And, um, and finally, some of the business, you know, leaders like the CEOs and the CIOs who are trying to think of the, you know, the bigger picture here. So, you know, I'll try my best. It's hard to, you know, go in deep on each of these. Um, so at the end, there's a list of email addresses and contact details. So, you know, please contact us if you have other questions. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see how things go. So just briefly on my background, um, just to give a bit of context of where I'm coming from with some of my comments. Um, so I did my PhD at Manchester University, focused on CFD development, turbulence modelling. Um, after that, I left to go into industry to Lotus F1 team, um, which is now the Renault Sport F1 team. And that's when I got to really, you know, apply the things I'd learned in academia into industry and kind of see both sides, um, which was really useful. Did go back to, you know, university afterwards as a postdoc because I, you know, I really felt like I had more learning to do. I wanted to dive a bit deeper and trying to understand things more. So that was, you know, really good. Worked on some interesting EU projects on, you know, automotive aerospace type applications with high fidelity CFD. Um, then went over to NASA, which was probably one of the most, you know, influential times because you really get the other picture. So things like, you know, overset grids and um, structured meshing and the kind of the way that the aerospace sector does it differently than I suppose the automotive sector. Um, so that was great. And then I had a few, you know, things when I came back focusing on being a consultant and helping some projects. So like at Williams Advanced Engineering, that was great to see what consultancy companies like on some, you know, Le Mans type things, touring cars, other kind of motorsport things other than Formula One. Um, and then I suppose most recently it's things like at Formula One Management, um, helping them, you know, as a consultant on some of the CFD HPC, which is where I was first introduced to AWS and will be some of the things that I'll speak about in this webinar, focused on the 2022, uh, now the 2022 rules. Um, and British Cycling, working on the Olympic bike, which was great. And the final thing um, before I joined AWS was as a senior researcher at Oxford, leading an automotive aerodynamics research group. So, um, intro and background over, you know, what are the big challenges for motorsport? Well, time's always limited. I don't think I've heard of any situation where someone says, Neil, don't worry, just, you know, maybe in a couple of weeks or just let me know when you've had time. No, it's, you need it now, it's gonna be done ASAP. Um, it's the same money, you know? I mean, yeah, some of the big Formula One teams have lots of money, but it's always tight because there's lots to do. Um, you know, they don't want to waste money. And both of those things really pushes the need for highly automated, highly efficient processes to, you know, get the best out of your time and your money. So, you know, before diving into CFD for motorsport, let's just take one step higher, you know, why CFD and why aerodynamics? So, you know, in this case, there are multiple reasons. Um, one simple reason is for most motorsport categories, and I'm going to use Formula One for a lot of examples, um, the, it's the speed around the corners that's really going to make the difference when you're going quickly. And anyone can attest to that if you've been in a, you know, a fast car a circuit. Going around the corners is where you feel the G and the excitement. Um, and you can do a simple analogy of grip you know, on the tyres around the corner which is that if you put your hand on the desk and you put some light pressure and you can slide left to right, if you start to really push down on the desk and try and slide left to right, you can feel that resistive force, you know, that, that grip. 
So in a very simplistic way, to maximize the cornering speed around a corner, you want the tires to have as much grip. And one way of doing that is to use aerodynamics. So in the opposite way to a plane where you're trying to generate lift, you're trying to create downforce to push the car and push those tires onto the rubber to help you go around the corners fast. Now, the problem is, of course, you're not just going around corners, you're also going along straights, and therefore you want a very efficient car with low drag. So somehow you've got to come up with high downforce and low drag, and that's why you need lots of aerodynamics to do that. And the final one is just simply the rules. You know, it may be the case that having a bigger engine or better tyres would be the best way to get performance, but they're either typically banned or they're very expensive to do. So aerodynamics tends to be the best cost to performance, to making it done quickly sort of thing, and hence why it's so important for motorsport. So I suppose if you want to create some aerodynamic surfaces like what you saw in the car, um, how do you test them? So one way is you can just build a car and take it to a track and test it, you know, which is quicker. That's the ultimate test. Um, you've got a picture here as an example of a test where you can also look at some flow field measurements by using these PETA probes. But the problem is they're expensive because you actually have to build a car, not just the external aerodynamics, but, you know, the engine, the gearbox, everything to make it go around. Um, and the real reason, particularly for Formula One and for many other motorsport, is it's limited or banned in the rules because of the expense. So Formula One, you can only do a, you know, a few tests outside the season, so it's not really appropriate for designing a car. The second option is wind tunnel tests. So you could actually take it to you know, a wind tunnel, which essentially now you don't need a car that can actually drive. You just need the outer shell, just the aerodynamic surfaces, and you blow the air over it. And so that's you know, why it's used. Um, it can still be expensive because you actually need to have a wind tunnel and you need to make the parts and take it there. Um, but it is much cheaper than going track testing in terms of um, not having to take all your people, fly them around the world, etc. But there is still some questions also around how well does it resemble real life? You know, the cornering. Can you really get cornering right in a wind tunnel that's you know, usually a straight uh, test section? Which leads to the topic of today, uh, which is computational fluid dynamics. And, you know, the idea is no manufacture. Um, it's cheap and fast. There's a star in there because anyone who's in CFD or wind tunnels or motorsport know that that's a kind of topic of debate. Um, and the biggest question is accuracy. You know, is it accurate enough? Yes, you can just have someone on a CAD screen drawing some parts, push it through, but is it accurate? And accuracy is kind of where the AWS angle comes in to it because I don't want to go in depth on CFD turbulence modeling and things like that, but I just want to give a high level appreciation of really a few of the factors that come into this. So we need to solve these Navier-Stokes equations. We need to use some numerical methods and we could just do DNS. We just solve them. No modeling, you know, we would need to have hundreds of billions of cells to capture all the smallest scales of turbulence. It would probably have to run hundreds of thousands of cores for maybe a month. And if you work some rough costing, you're talking between one and two million dollars. So it's not that you can or can't do it, it's just the expense. Even if it gave you the right answer, you could probably do thousands of wind tunnel tests um, or even track tests for the same price. So it's just not cost efficient. On the other side of the, the coin, you've got RANDs, which is our low fidelity method, relatively speaking, where you don't try and resolve all these complex scales of turbulence, but you model them. And the problem with that is the modeling itself obviously requires you to make some assumptions. Um, so that's not always completely accurate, um, but the cost goes from hundreds of billions of cells to hundreds of millions, from hundred thousands of cores to maybe only a couple of hundred, and from four weeks to eight hours. And the big one is it's maybe only around hundred dollars. So the cost difference is, you know, massive. Now, what we're going to focus on in this webinar, in terms of the use case anyway, is something between the two. Um, I'm going to purposely keep it quite high level. We'll just call them hybrid methods, where we try to you know, resolve some of the flow and keep some of the modeling. And that means we probably need something you know, closer to the rounds, 500 million cells, uh, but we, it is transient in nature um, because of the transient nature of turbulence. 
So maybe eight hours, but now I'm assuming we've got 10 times more cores, which is also going to be the theme of today. Um, now the cost goes from maybe 100 to $1,500, but the accuracy is better. Now, how do we quantify the accuracy? Well, anyone who works in motorsport knows it's a highly sensitive, secretive world where there aren't that many publications. Um, but certainly when it comes to kind of more open source models, like the, the work that I did in the past with the drive air model, a kind of road car, you know, it was very clear that there was an improvement. And this graph, you know, um, pretty much shows it for two different car types. And I'll, I'll ask you just to focus on the red ones, which is the estate type vehicle not the fastback, the fastback doesn't too bad, but the estate, and you can see that the ones on the left are the RANs, the low fidelity, and the ones on the right are the high fidelity. What you can basically see is that the low fidelity get the sign wrong and assume there's lift when there's actually uh, downforce, whereas these high fidelity get it the right way around. And this is why major car companies have now moving to these hybrid methods, even though they can be five to even 20 times more computationally expensive. So, the issue now becomes, OK, I want to go to these high fidelity methods, but you saw that when I was talking about that the five or 20 times more, how do you fit that in an engineering design process that is built around typically having your results back within a day or certainly overnight? You could do that with the RANs, but what about the hybrid RANs? Now, even on a normal cluster, just with your standard process, how many of you out there are used to being stuck in a queue. How many of you have had to send an email to your sysadmin saying, could you please bump up my priority? Or even worse, start you know sending out emails to the whole group, you know, why this user is hogging up the queue. I know I've been in those situations. I also know I've been in the situations of begging for more disk space and promising that I'll delete them. And that's just with you know normal kind of current day processes um, using these RANs type things. What about if you do it to the high fidelity where we say you need access to two and a half thousand cores, not 200 cores? Now, what currently happens is you try and fit it in this box. You say, I bought myself a cluster, X number of cores, let's say a thousand cores, and we fit inside that. Now, what if someone wants to run a thousand cores? Everybody has to be kicked off the cluster so you can run on it, and it still might take a week. What we believe at AWS is that you shouldn't have to worry about that. You know, you shouldn't have to worry about capacity. You should just worry about the end business need, which is to have accurate CFD. If you need to run this case, run it. And that's what you can do in AWS. You can just say, I want to run this case on 5,000 cores and you can run it, no queue. But if you want to run on 200 cores, again, you can run. And you only pay for the time you're using it. So you don't need to provision a big cluster for the off chance that you're going to run this big hybrid RANs LES simulation, this high fidelity one. Um, because if you just need it, you'll spin it up. And if you don't, you don't. And this is important because how many of you have been in situations, and I know I have, where you have a current cluster, let's say it's a thousand cores, and it's been fine, you're running no problem. And then you get a customer comes in who says, I want to run and it needs to be these high fidelity because this is what the industry is going towards. I need it for the accuracy. And you don't know what to do because you don't have the capacity. But then you speak to your business leader and say, oh, can we please buy a bigger cluster? Number one, even if they say yes, it's going to take weeks or months to get it. Or they might turn back and go, mm, but how many of those customers do you have? Is it just one? Are you sure you're going to have more? It gets hard. You might have to turn it away. Where on AWS, it doesn't matter if it's just one customer who needs you to run one run for one hour, that's fine, you can do it because you're only paying as you're using it. And I really do think that that is a, a quite a big shift and shouldn't be you know, underestimated how it can transform the way that you operate. So as we were saying, you know, large scale infrastructure really enables this on ABS side. We also have you know, latest to the latest technology um, and you can be really flexible. Now. The reason that we can do this is the global infrastructure. The fact that, you know, as I'm recording this, there are 24 regions around the world with at least 76 availability zones. And in each of those availability zones, there are multiple data centers with lots of servers. So you can do the maths to figure out that there's a lot of infrastructure and a lot of capacity. And this is really what enables you to be able to just say, yeah, I'm just going to run a thousand calls now, spin it up and spin it down. 
The other thing is that we have lots and lots of platforms, lots of types of hardware that you can use. If you just want to use you know, an Intel CPU, great, we've got it. But what if you want to use a GPU? We also have it. And what if you have a code that doesn't scale very well in terms of parallel performance and therefore you need to have lots of RAM? We even have one that has 12 terabytes of RAM. So you can just pick and choose. You know, you don't have to figure out at the beginning what you're going to do. If your situation changes, no problem. You can just change your configuration. Now, the one for CFD that is probably going to be used the most is the C5N, which is our Intel Skylake processor. So this has up to 36 physical cores, 192 gigabytes of RAM, and I'm going to show some benchmark results and they'll be done using this. But we also have some of the highest end GPUs, like the Tesla V100, the NVIDIA ones, which, you know, are really top of the range for any machine learning or even just, you know, doing really good graphics rendering. Underpinning these is EFA, our elastic fabric adapter. You know, and it's probably the one thing that people most are concerned about with the cloud performance for CFD is the network and saying, ah, it's too slow, you can't scale. It's not anymore the case. With EFA, you get the high network bandwidth, low latency that can give you the scaling um, that I'm gonna demonstrate in a few slides time. And the other one is the parallel file system. So everybody needs a good file system. Nobody likes it to be laggy when you're trying to move files around or write to disk. And we have that with Amazon FSx for Lustre. So let's show some actual benchmarking. Everyone loves benchmarking. There's going to be a live demo, but let's show some graphs. And the first one is with OpenFoam, the ESI version of OpenFoam 1912. It's the standard uh, motorbike case. And this one's starting small, 4 million cells. And you can see that we achieve linear scaling up to 144 cores. So this is about 20,000 cells per core. But it's a small test case, but it's nice to see. So we can go to 28 million. Maybe this is a bit closer to what people are using. And again, still linear scaling up to 1100 cores, again, around 20,000, 30,000 cells per core. Now, at some point, everyone knows the bigger the cases get, there becomes a point where it stops. And this is also down to the linear, the linear solvers, like the multigrid, which is used in this case. But you're still getting good scaling, linear scaling to about 2,500 cores. Um, and even at 4,000, it's still not too bad. Now, I should say as well that, you know, we have an internal tuning team who are looking at every code and how can we optimize and run it the best. So this is an example of where we found that Intel MPI actually gives better performance than Open MPI. For, open, for example, and we give that guidance back to our customers. And we do this on lots and lots of codes. So how about Star CCM? So here's a Formula One wing, um, rear wing, a simplified example, only 5 million cells, but it scales linearly to 144 cores. The point with this is you pay the same price when it's linear at running at 144 as you do at 36, but it's just faster. So, you know, it's a win-win. Now, the test case that we're actually going to be showing today is 400 million cells, two Formula 1 cars following each other. And this um, stays linear scaling to about 4,500 cells, um, cores, which is just less than 100,000 cells per core. It still stays pretty good scaling as we go up to 7,000, but, you know, cost efficiency matters. So you really want to stay on the linear side as much as possible. And um, this is still pretty good. And we'll show it later on in the demo. And finally, um, we have the ones from Fluent. This is actually comparing against the Cray XC50, showing you know as good scaling, if not better, all the way up to nearly 7,000 cores. Um, I'm just showing for these codes, we have many, many other ones, but uh, I'm limited on time. Now, in the end, you know it's good to actually have a you know a case study of a real customer who was doing this, um, and that was Formula One. You know they had to use CFD to design the now 2022 um, car regulations, thousands of design iterations, single and following car. Um, and they decided to use a combination of RAND and DS. And I think they were very, you know, future thinking to use these high fidelity methods, you know, right from the beginning, because the truth is they didn't have access to a wind tunnel because it was a small group of people working on it. it wasn't, you know, like a large Formula One team. It was the management. And, um, you know, in the end, they wanted to be sure and to, you know, to spend the extra time and money to use these high fidelity methods, which in the end turned out to be true. And when there was wind tunnel test done, you know, the flow features and the correlation was, was much better with these. 
but the consequence was it was big models, you know, half a billion cells sometimes. And with the access to the resources that they had at the time, they were running these on maybe 100, 190 cores and taking at least 60 hours to run. When they were able to work with AWS, we managed to go from 60 hours to, you know, like 12 hours by being able to go from 200 cores to 1,440 cores, for example. And that really makes a big difference because that's, uh, you know, a three-day turnaround time to, you know, less than a day overnight. And we're still working with them, you know, every day we're trying to go higher and higher cores, help them with their CFD process, and even add extra workflows like RAND's um, design optimization type of workflows. Now, all this was run uh, with, in this case, Parallel Cluster, which is one of our products that helps you to provision a cluster without having to do lots of manual stuff yourself. And I'm gonna show you a demo um, in a few minutes time using this um, service. So what is the example test case? Well, this is a 2017 era Formula One car. And it's as realistic as you, know, you would typically run. So with radiators, with engine exhaust, with air intake, and there's two of them and they're both a full car. So I'll let you have a look at the, uh, the text on the right you know, it's the standard sort of Formula One boundary conditions in terms of the speed and the, the belt moving and things like that. And I'd like to thank Formula One for allowing um, me to use this test case today. So here's a quick slide on numerical methods. Some of you may glaze over on this. Some of you may like it or want more detail. Please reach out if you want any more detail. And at this point, I'd like to thank Siemens for very graciously providing me with licenses to run this with Star CCM. Um, so the demo will be with uh, the latest version of Star CTM. So there's RAND simulations using Kaomega SST, um, and then hybrid RAND LES simulations using the SST DDS, um, and with a hybrid numerical scheme to try and keep it low dissipation and as accurate uh, as possible. Now, just to make a note, remember the, the scaling. So the, the cases that I'll be running, the reason I'm picking around 4,500 cores to run these on is because that's the linear point of scalability. And again, if you're really caring about cost efficiency, you'll try and stick as much as possible to linear scaling. So that's why um, it's run on that. So um, yeah, let's jump in and, and see how we do it in real life. Okay, great. Let's start the demo then. So before we can actually run our CFD simulations, we actually need to create a cluster. Now, I suppose if you were doing this on an on-premise environment, this would take weeks or months to decide what you're going to buy and to go out and procure it and then install it. Um, we'll hopefully be able to set this up in about 10 minutes. So the first step, if you're new to AWS, is you're going to create an account and you're probably going to come in through the AWS Management Console. And here you're going to see the big list of services we have. Definitely encourage you to play around and have a look. But what we need to do, um, we don't actually have to go through the console. We could just do this all from our own terminal, which I'll show you later, um, but for true beginners who maybe don't have some um, things pre-installed, we can just use Cloud9, which is the AWS development environment, which basically allows you to create a terminal-like environment. So here's one I created earlier, but we'll, we'll make a new one just to show you the steps. So let's call it demo. We'll pick a, a small instance, so uh, you know something with, only one gig of RAM, one CPU, because we're just using it to, in a development sense. Next step, and then create the environment. It's just set it up. So now we can actually install a few extra things that we need to. So the first thing that we need to install is the Amazon command line interfaces. This is basically just the tools that we need to be able to launch things straight from the terminal. So for example, now you can do AWS S3 or AWS EC2, rather than having to actually go through the management console. We'll just stick that in our path. We're next going to interact with our cluster through an SSH key to give us the secure access. So we need to create one. So I'm gonna create an SSH key, and then we'll just change the permissions. The next thing is we're actually going to install the service that we're gonna use, which is Parallel Cluster. 
So parallel cluster basically enables you to very easily create a cluster without having to do all the manual configuring yourself, without having to launch the EC2 instances manually and connect them with the interfacing and the security groups. It does it all in one step. Uh, and that's a nice way to really get started. So now that's installed, you, so you saw there was what, five commands. We can now do pcluster, and this is our way of creating a cluster. Now, what the first step is, your know, first time user, is to use the configure option, which basically asks you some questions. So now it's gonna say, where do you wanna run this? So I'm saying in Dublin. Then it's gonna say, which SSH key do you want to use to be able to access that cluster? So I'll pick the one I just created. What scheduler do you want to use? This may not be relevant for some people. This is just a way that you would submit jobs to the cluster. Pick SG. Which um, operating system? So I'm going to pick Amazon Linux 2. You could pick CentOS or Ubuntu if you wanted to. Now, what's the smallest cluster size we want it to be able to be? So we want it to go to zero if we're not doing anything. But we want it to be able to go up maybe to 10,000 cores. Now, master instance is the head node. So if you're not familiar with how clusters typically work, you usually have a head node that you'll connect to to be able to submit jobs. And it could be something very small, it could be something with minimal RAM, minimal CPU, because you just want to go and submit jobs. Or, as in the case with this, you may want to have a GPU, something a bit bigger, so you can actually do some visualization. Um, and this is suitable in the case where the cluster's only going to be around for a few hours and then I'm going to take it back down again. So for that, I'm going to pick our G4, which is an NVIDIA T4 GPU with 32 physical cores and 256 gigabytes of RAM, which is probably similar to what you might have in a high-powered workstation. And then the compute is the instances that all the benchmarks were done with that I previously showed, the Intel Skylake, 36 physical cores, 192 gigabytes of RAM, C5N, 18x large. So for the VPC, this is our virtual private cloud. This is our own isolated bit of the broader AWS cloud. And each region has its own VPC and one's been set up by default already. This has the security groups, the access lists already predefined. You could create your own, but we'll just take the, uh, the default. And then for the subnets, these are essentially by default one per availability zone. So we'll just take one availability zone here. We'll just can take a random, we'll just take the first one, and then we'll put the compute within the same subnet. You can have more elaborate setups, um, but we won't go into that now. Okay, so it's basically created a template for your cluster. And you can go in to this directory and have a look at it. And so you see, it's basically just what we put in. It just says, what's the region it's running in, how you can SSH to it, the instance types, the VPC settings, okay? As you'll see later, we can add some extra features to this, but if you were to keep it at its most simple level, you could just do P cluster, create motorsport demo, and that's just gonna go off and create a cluster for us to use. So that's, some of the simple steps. And as I said, there's a step-by-step -step tutorial that you can get that will go through this. We can actually now move over to my machine because I've got some things pre-installed and we can actually look at my parallel cluster config file. So you can see it actually looks quite similar. We've got the same sort of instance types. I've just added a few things around placement groups to make sure the nodes are close together. Something around with the EFA to make sure we have that turned on which is needed for CFD, good scaling. Uh, it's going to access my S3 buckets, which is where we'll put things for long-term storage. Uh, FSX, which is our parallel file system, the Lustre. I've got myself uh, just over nine terabytes. And then DCV, so that's remote visualization. So with all that, I can show you again that we could just do peak Lustre, create maybe demo motorsport demo two. And it's going to go off and create that cluster. Okay, but I've already made one before. So 
first thing we're going to do is actually we're going to move some data over to there because what if you had actually you know created a, a star ctm file or some geometry and you wanted to move over to it well one of the things that we can do is we can actually access our s3 straight from my laptop or it could, could be your workstation so my do s ls it's going to tell you all the files i've got and the one that i'm interested in is what we're going to call hash sport demo it's going to show you the files i've got here so i've actually got all the cases that i've pre-run uh, star ctm installation and some some scripts but what if i actually wanted to upload something to the to the case so let's say i go into my documents and i've got something on my demo and here i've got my pre-mesh file now i'm just going to change the name of this because we've actually already got it uploaded so let's call it v2 and now i can just actually just copy that so here we go demo and that's actually just going to upload that to my s3 bucket on aws now you can see one gigabyte it's probably just about acceptable to do it but if it's large cases you can start to see the logic of, of why you want to actually have things being done you know on the cloud and keep it there okay so let's actually go to a cluster that i've already um created so what i can do is say p cluster list so these are various clusters that i have and the one that i'm going to want to connect to is the motorsport one and i'm going to use an ssh key that i've created okay so i'm on the cluster and what do i have well i've actually pre-installed star ccm and i've got various files here uh, i've also got a bash rc set up where i've got some shortcuts to be able to, to basically be able to load up star ccm easily but for some of you you may actually prefer to go and launch this in a graphical way and so one way of doing it is to use our dcv which is the remote visualization the way to do the remote desktop so we can go straight to that just here and so now we've got probably what's more familiar to you which is a kind of linux uh, desktop and we can go where we want to go okay so first step is i've actually got the case so why don't we have a look at what i have so i'm just going to launch this case here and we can just have a look at how it's set up okay so pretty standard got some parts in here got main which is actually my car then i've got some radiators and these are all refinement boxes to customize my mesh i've got some meshing set up here with some default controls so i've got a certain base size using a trim a mesh so it's pretty standard and then i've got some volume refinement some things to around the curves and and surfaces and then this is going to be a RAND simulation to begin with so i'm using the sst model and i've got some you know region set up porous media for the radiators and a main with the boundaries okay some solve settings using the coupled solver got various reports set up to give me breakdown of all the, the parts some monitors to calculate means that we use later some plots show the lift the drag etc and then some scenes and we can actually open this up which is just going to take a moment to display because it's actually going to do some nice rendering at the same time okay 
So now it's showing the two cars using the rendering options that's in Star CTM. And you can see that we've got two, you know, properly realistic Formula One type cars. Uh, and we've got two of them and they're full cars. There's not a symmetry plane in the middle. They are two actually two full cars. Okay, great. So now the first step is to mesh this. So if we close this down, we can see that I've got a mesh Java, very simple just to generate the volume mesh. And we've got a submission script. Now this probably looks very similar to anyone who's used a normal supercomputer. I've got some things to mod to load some modules. Up here I've got how many cores I'm going to run on. And then I've got the commands to actually run star CTM using a batch. And that's the file name at the end. Now the point with this, if I go Q stat, there's nothing running. So do Q host, there's nothing there. You haven't lost anything. So all we have is the head node up. There are no compute nodes. We're not paying for any compute nodes. But the great thing with parallel clusters, once I click submit, it's actually going to put it in the queue. So you can see now it's saying, I want to run 108 cores. So that's um, three of the C5N instances. And at the moment, there's nothing. So if we put date, so 8.49 UTC, we'll see that in a few moments, it will have spun up the instance. It's basically the background of parallel cluster is it's sending a signal once it sees that you want some cores to go off and use an auto scaling group to fire up those number of instances you want. And then once the job stops, it's gonna have a certain number of minutes that it will see if anything else wants to run on them. And then if it sees no load or nothing in the queue, it will shut them back down. So it's a very elastic cluster, which is fantastic if you only want to pay for what you actually use and then bring it back down again. So let's just wait until they launch. Okay, we can see that it started at 8.55. So that was around five, six minutes for those 108 to launch. And we can have a look at what's happening. So you can see it's actually going through the mesh stage. So it's still in the surface mesh. And it should take around 80 minutes or so. Okay, so the next stage is to look at the mesh that we made rather than waiting those 80 minutes. And this mesh is quite large, it ends up being about 403 million cells. So it tends to be better to actually launch this in a client server mode. Uh, and so to do this, we've got a script here. So we're going to push it on 700 cores and then we'll connect to it and have a look at the mesh. So submit to rounds post. So again, you can see QStat here. We've got the mesh job running. And now we're queuing up to 720. If we go Q host, so we've got three instances. So now we're going to wait again for the rest for another 720 cores to come up. Okay, let's see what happened there. So 906, so it took three minutes for another 720 cores to come up. So what we can actually do now is connect to it. So we can launch start CCM. And we will connect to that IP. Okay, it's just loading up now. And we can have a look at the mesh. So it's just repartitioning from 108 to 720 cores. Okay, there we go. So we've got a hex dominant mesh around the two cars with some extra refinement around the wake. You can see that there's in this Y slice, there's another one to try and capture the main flow. Obviously, this isn't a perfect optimized mesh. 
and just to, so you can see it's yeah 403 million 480,000 cells okay so we can close this down and it's gone so the next thing we want to do is actually solve it so let's have a look at the solve so here it's going to run on 4680 cores in batch mode using those run.java run.java's here so it's just going to um, run and then export what the reports are to the forces you could include lots of extra things to do some automatic post-processing as well the reason i picked 4680 is from the scaling graph that you saw before that was the point where linear scalability was still good anything beyond that point uh, it would run faster but you would start to pay a little bit more um, because you're coming off the linear curve and most motorsport want to try and keep as cost efficient uh, as possible so let's submit that case solve now again we've got 4680 cores it wants so we do q host so this shows the ones we've got we've got the 108 and we've got the 720 because that only stopped a few minutes ago so they're still up so we'll wait again and we'll see how long it takes to provision the 4680 cores okay let's check and there you go it's running 950 so five minutes to launch over four and a half thousand cores okay let's see what's happening with the actual case can have a look at the output there we go it's starting the parallel server and what we're going to do actually is we're going to do the same thing we're going to go and launch to it so we know what the node is I can type quickly seven dash and there we go so it's now connected to it so we can keep an eye on it as it's running it's currently partitioning and it's set to go for you know 2000 glad I enabled that or that would have kept going So I can disconnect from that and we can just let it run. Okay, so the next point is we want to look at something which has run. So let's look at the RANS solve. So here's one that actually solved. And we'll do the same as before and we'll actually uh, launch some more so another 720 and then we can connect to it and have a look at how that result looked okay let's have a look so there it is another 720 so we'll launch with our CCM and we'll connect to that so that Six four. So here we can have a look at, let's say, the lift of the front car and of the second car. So you can see there's a quite a large drop with the second car following, which is the whole point of why the regulations have been looked at by Formula Management. And we can actually then look at some of the seats. So we can open up CP. And I'd actually pre repartition this to 720 cores 
So hopefully it will launch a bit faster. And there we have the pressure coefficient on the bottom of the first card. So you can see the downforce on the front wing and the rear wing and over the floor. Finally, let's maybe look at some streamlines to see how the flow is moving over the two cars. Let's put the full full screen. OK, we can see the streamlines have come up. This is a nice illustration of the flow from the front car to the to the following car. You can see the flow coming off the tires uh, and then the kind of mushroom effect from the rear wing that's shooting the flow upwards. But you're still seeing that the, the car behind is taking a lot of that flow on the front wing straight over to the rear wing. And that explains some of why the downforce is reduced so much uh, on the second car. OK, so that's a RAND. So maybe we can actually go on and have a look at the DS uh, simulation. OK, so actually, I've already run these cases. So let's just close a couple of them down. No need to be wasting money or time. So that's killing. You can just use the normal QStat command so it's gone. We'll kill this one as well. And there we go, they're gone. Now, you can still see that all the instances are up there, and they'll stay up there for around 10 minutes by default, unless you make it stricter and want it to be cut after five minutes. But we're actually going to go now and run a DS case. OK, I purposely left a few minutes to demonstrate what happens when there's nothing in the queue, which there wasn't because I killed them, and then queue host. So they're all gone, so nothing's being used. OK, but now we do actually want to run something. So let's run it. And let's also, at the same time, launch up one that I have actually already run. OK, so now, again, it's going to try and provision over 5,000 cores and spin them all back up again, and you can see there's nothing here. So let's just wait for that to happen. OK, we can check. Yeah, 956, so now 10, 1002, so it's about four minutes, six minutes to launch those cores. So we can actually go and have a look, see how that's getting on. So tail the output file. You can see now it's actually going through the iterations. It's taking about 0.7 seconds per iteration. So we can actually stop that and we can have a look at the one that's already ran. So we'll launch that up. And we can just have a look, first of all, maybe at just some of the type of settings. So we got a DDS, SSD DDS, segregated flow, hybrid banded central differencing, got a time step 5e to minus 4. That is reasonably large, but that's not uncommon for industrial workflows. And we can actually have a look at the CP, for example. And there's the, the CP. We can also have a look at, for example, maybe the, the downforce of the lead car, the trailing car. Maybe also look at the time average. So you can see that it has um, averaged out reasonably well over two seconds of flow time. So we can close those down. And then maybe we can look at the total time it took. So that's about 24,000 seconds, which if we convert that into hours is around six and a bit hours from start to finish. So that's compared to the benchmark that we did. If you ran on 360 cores, which I don't think is uncommon for typical core usage for, for people's on-premise type facilities, it was about 23 seconds per iteration. Works out to be just over five days. So that's a speed up from five days to 
about six hours. So from it taking a whole work week to just taking a morning and some of the afternoon, that's really what the capacity and the scale of AWS gives you to change your to change your workflow. So let's close down these. Finished. We can also kill these jobs because we don't need them. I suppose the final thing really is if you wanted to upload something to then store it after the simulation's finished. Now these are big files. Um, the the full solution file for this is 232 gigabytes. But we would just then look to store that and send it back. So if we want to do that, so I actually already have this, so I'm just gonna give it a different name. And I can just do S3 copy. Let's put it to that S3 bucket. There you go. It's going to transfer it. It's going to take a bit of time. You can script this about 200, 200 and something megabytes a second. So that's basically how you would go from start to finish creating a cluster creating these files, meshing, running, posting, using up to probably a bit thousand cores. And at the end, we will submit the job, finish off and then send it back up to S3. And then the final bit really, because I'll just cancel this transfer, is to close down the cluster if you don't want to use it anymore. If you really want to get rid of the head node, you don't want to pay for anything, you want to completely close everything down. Let's go back to our terminal. And do, if I log out, do p cluster list, p cluster delete mode spot. And that's going to get rid of it. Now I want to keep this up because I'd like to keep playing around. So actually, I'll just delete one of the old ones just to show what it looks like. There you go. So it's going to delete it, and then it'll be completely gone. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that demo. You know, I think the takeaway points was just how quickly you could provision that many cores. The cluster itself only took, you know, 10 minutes to set up, and then it was five or six minutes to get nearly 5,000 cores. And then it spun down when you didn't need them. The other take home message was, you know, it would have taken about five days with this particular time step and, and the case to get that turnaround time where it was six hours on four and a half thousand cores. So five days to six hours. That's pretty transformative. Means that an engineer doesn't have to wait a whole week to find out if they've got a result. They can just take six hours. And remember, there's no cost difference. You know, 360 cores for five days is the same price as four and a half thousand for six hours if the scaling is linear, which it was. But the question you may have is, okay, that looked a little bit more like how an individual user would do it. What about I'm a big company, got hundreds of engineers, hundreds of users, lots of applications. How do I use AWS? Well, actually, um, best place to look is internally for us, for an example, because most of you probably have a, an Amazon Echo or Alexa, and that's done by Lab126, Amazon. You know, 3,000 employees, proper engineering effort going on there, and they use AWS. And they don't just use one code, they use multiple codes. You know, CAE, not just CFD. Um, Fluent, Abacus, Darcy CM, NS Dyno, OpenFoam, AccuSolve, Console, on CPUs and GPUs. And they appreciate the cost, runtime benefit and, and issues. Now this graph really illustrates it to me. Um, on the left side, you've got the number of nodes, so the amount of computers, and on the bottom, the date. What you're seeing is that you know normally they're tracking along using 50 nodes, 100 nodes, but then they had a really important point of meeting they need to hit, which says, let's we need to know we've got a big exec meeting. They suddenly ramped up to 1500 nodes because they had this meeting they had to get these results for. And then two days later, they drop back down. That's only possible with the capacity and the infrastructure that we have on AWS to be able to spike like that and drop straight back down. And they're only paying, remember, for the time they're using all those nodes, and then they just go back to normal. I hope you could see that for any motorsport environment or any CFD environment, the ability to spike before an important deadline and then come back down 
could be really useful for your business. Now, they also ended up creating a reference architecture that you can go out and use. It's fully templated. You can download it and provision a cluster in a similar way to they do, allowing multiple applications, multiple users, um, using many um, Amazon um, services. So please go ahead and, and try it and we'll be more than happy to, to give you some advice on that and support you in your, your implementations. So what are the engagement models? Well, we work with you know a whole range from the biggest enterprises you can think of with hundreds to thousands of users to consultancies who are wanting to help them or work with smaller companies, researchers and universities in the public sector, and partners. Um, what if you want to actually develop a new CFD code and run on AWS? We're here to help you with that as well. And how would you work with us? Well, you can either speak to us directly, and I've got some contact details on the next slides. Um, we can also bring in our own internal consultancy teams, ProServe, to come in to your office in your account and help you to set it up. We also have lots of great partners. Um, if you don't feel you have the knowledge in-house or you don't want to use ProServe as partners, you can just work directly with partners. And we have lots of them who actually have their back end on, on AWS. And of course, all of them. Sometimes we have partners, ProServe and ourselves. So this is, an, you know, not all of our partners. And I, I apologize for any that I've missed out. There are more joining every single day, but you can probably identify some people who may be of relevance to you. So what's the summary? Think big. Do not be limited by capacity. Do not just do the way that you've always done it. You know, there is a new normal where you don't have to think about that. It's not just about HPC. For me, it's about the next generation CFD methods and just approaches in general to your whole design that can change. We support pretty much all the codes. I mean, you can think pretty much any CFD or CA code has been run on AWS, and we probably have the knowledge in-house with the optimized recipes to get the best out of it. We work from individuals all the way up to full enterprise solutions for hundreds to thousands of engineers. We've done it all. We have many ways of dealing with you and helping you. AWS Direct, with ProServe, with partners, you know, we will make sure that we get it right and we'll bring in any resources that we need to, to do that. So talk to us. I put up a, you know, a list of people here who have been helping out with this webinar and a part of kind of Automotive Pacific help. So from the kind of technical side like myself to the business development people in various regions around the world, uh, marketing, if you want to discuss about how you might want to use marketing, uh, partners, if you'd like to become a partner. And if you want to have a go, we have at the top, if you click that link, there's a CFD campaign at the moment with Intel where you can get $100 of free credits um, and you also get like a free detailed tutorial, step-by-step -step how to go through it. Um, if you instantly want something more than that, reach out to us and we'll start speaking to you uh, as soon as possible. So with that, thank you very much. I'm very happy to answer any questions.